Welcome to Nothing Is Real, a podcast about the Beatles. Everybody thinks they know the Beatles, but how much do we really know? My name is Jason Carty. My name is Stephen Cockcroft. And we're live on tape from Dublin and Belfast. On the 26th of August 1968, the Beatles released Hey Jude, their 18th UK single and the first to appear with the Apple label at its core. The single was a massive success, spending nine weeks at number one in the US and running at a long seven minutes and 11 seconds. But shut up, it's bloody Hey Jude by the bloody Beatles. Um, we need to look at this song, Stephen, and this is essentially episode one, The Road to Hey Jude, which is paved with good intentions, we might say. I see what you did there. See what I did there? Um, because once we started pulling this thread, there's a there's a, a, a lot of threads that go into it. And first of all, we probably need to say from the outset that there's an origin myth, like, like all superheroes, about this story. Paul wrote it because John was divorced from Cynthia. He wrote it for Julian and then... John thought it was about him because of all the mention of shoulders. That's kind of what More everybody knows about Hey Jude. That's it. That's really all you yeah. need to know. <clears throat> so next week we're available in the regular places at Beatles Pod. Only joking. Um, there's, but once you kind of pull the thread, uh, it's a very. Uh, let's ask the big question: Do you like Hey Jude, Stephen? I do like Hey Jude in its original form. What's its original form? No, this single. I, I, oh, the single. Okay. I, 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 I there was some other form. No, no, I, I don't. I, 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 I can do without the mass sing-alongs um, at okay. every at every opportunity. Although, having said that, you know, when we were in Liverpool to see Paul McCartney and Hey Jude starts up, and my yeah. initial my initial cynicism, I thought, oh, here we go. You know, everybody on the left, everybody on the right, all, all the girls, <laughs> everybody with ginger hair saying no, everybody. But I just got completely swept up in uh, in the emotion a hundred percent and i think i think we were probably so this would have been december 2018 i think we even said before the gig oh he's going to do bloody hey jude and then yeah. he does it and you're like oh it's the guy who invented hey jude <laughs> there he is right there yeah so i was yeah I'm, I'm, all, all my cynicism was swept away and that's a lot of cynicism folks um the what i would say is about hey jude is i think we take it for granted and I think it creates, um, in, a, in a band who'd already been hugely creative and influential for the previous five to six years, it, it, people didn't really notice that they're kind of creating a brand new type of song. It's, it's, it's a stadium rock song. It's a power ballad type song. It's, it's beyond pop and it's, it's the, the anthem. You know, they'd written songs that were hugely familiar and popular, obviously, but they're kind of crafting, you know, we're, we're kind of very used to anthemic rock these days. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. This is, this, this is stadium rock before stadium rock was a thing. Yeah. So for every, every time Chris Martin from Coldplay gets everyone to go, oh, e, oh, e, oh, or whatever in the audience, yeah. I think, I think, hey, Jude is to blame, but that is not a reason to not like, it hey, isn't, Jude. it I, isn't, it I'm isn't. not knocking Coldplay, folks. Um, are you knocking Coldplay? No, yeah, too- yeah. I saw I saw I, I saw Coldplay once uh, live, and they they did that, and they pushed giant balloons into the audience, and oh, it was great. I saw Coldplay supporting you too. I'd imagine that would have been a fun day out uh, for yourself. But this was back when this was back when one band was bigger than the other. Anyway, we we digress as normal. Um, so yeah, the origin myth of the Hey Jude story is based in the separation of John and Cynthia Lennon, in the position of Julian Lennon, in the entrance of Yoko Ono into proceedings. Uh, all of these things happen around May 1968. But there's a lot of overlap in the current uh, uh, things that we are talking about on Nothing Is Real. So we need to have a bit of a previously on Nothing Is Real in case anyone's coming to this episode de novo, um, which is that the Beatles have been in India with the Maharishi from February to April uh, for various lengths of time, but John and George uh, go the distance, staying until uh, a collapse in April uh, 1968. And while John is in India, he is getting notes from Yoko Ono. So that's kind of the, uh, you know, a, a regular communication that they are getting. So Yoko is slowly coming into the picture. And in fact, Yoko has been at a recording session even before India. Isn't that right? Yes. So, uh, Hey, Hey Bulldog back in February was and the first. any sense of the context as to why she's there? She's just there as a pal or a mate she's, or what's going on? I, I think, yeah, she's John's pal. 
Jason. <laughs> She's, she, she is John's pal. Well, this is the thing about John and Yoko is that the, the history is so written that this is the date they got together. Like it's carved into stone. But John and Yoko are hanging out a lot before this kind of momentous hooking up date in May 1968. It's difficult sometimes to cut through the mythologizing that has gone on, whether that's their yeah. original meeting at the Indica Gallery, you know, you know, it's it's written like a TV movie. Um, yes, and, and there has been TV movies. Uh, terrible TV movies. But mm. yeah, so you've got to, I think, look at the mythology that's been created that they still, you know, to this day, th that is being perpetuated. But then if you actually look at the day-to-day -day timeline, it doesn't quite fit with that. But yeah, back in, in February, they're at the Hey Bulldog session, which by all accounts, including everyone's favorite eyewitness, Jeff Emmerich, is a great session. Everybody's on top form. They're yeah. recording, they're, they're putting material down, both for the Yellow Submarine soundtrack and also to have material while they're in India. You know, yeah, they're anticip and, anticipating a, a sort of lengthy absence. Yes, and we have a, an early 1968 Nothing Is Real episode, in case you've missed it, about these issues. Um, but November 1966 is when John and Yoko first met, as you yeah. say, at the Indica Gallery, and he goes up the little step ladder and, you know, looks at the, uh, holds up the magnifying glass, looks at the ceiling and he sees the word, yes, that is another part of the John and Yoko creation myth. Yes. Um, but that is the end of 1966. And so it's a good 18 plus months until we get into the cut and thrust of John and Yoko becoming John and Yoko. So while they're in India, Yoko is sending John these postcards about look up into the clouds and look into the sky. I'll be a cloud. I'll be there. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, um, he, you know, so she's not invisible and we need to... I, I guess because history is always written in retrospect, uh, those letters in one parallel universe, they're just a form of fan mail, but in another parallel universe or the universe we're in, they become kind of the stepping stones of Yoko being on John's mind, you could say. I think that's right. I think they take on significance with hindsight. Um, mm. She, you know, John will describe her to Cynthia according to Cynthia, as just a kind of, oh, she's that kind of crazy artist that uh, is following, follows me around and, uh, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing really there. And it's the point at which John starts to think, okay, there's maybe a potential relationship here. Um, is this more than just a fan? Is this more than just somebody that I have a connection with on an artistic level? So, yeah, so Yoko is is definitely in the picture, in his consciousness when he's in India. And the next part of the story that we've also mentioned elsewhere is that when he is on the plane home with Cynthia after this rather traumatic collapse of their time with the Maharishi, John gets very drunk and then confesses all these infidelities to Cynthia. Yes, uh, he basically seems to go through every affair he's had since they got together uh, and sort of including sort of all of those liaisons on tour, et cetera, et cetera. And you must imagine that must have been an incredibly traumatic experience for Cynthia. So yeah. they're arriving home, having left what was an idyllic setting uh, under a cloud with the, the breakup with the Maharishi. And then all of this is sort of unloaded onto her as well. And you think, she must have been extremely naive if she wasn't aware mm. of, of of these things. But being aware on the back of your mind is one thing, but having them listed to you, uh, you know, on the back of an airplane napkin is uh, something else again. Yeah, I mean, it's it's from all accounts, it's a very sort of explicit, as you say, like a listing that happens that he, he tells her yeah. everything that's gone on and... You know, as you say, either Cynthia is naive or she chose to protect herself. You know, we all do things where we tell lies to ourselves to 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 keep the show on the road. And, you know, the the, the question is, that, you know, at the time and we discussed this in our John and Cynthia episode, you know, people would just stay married indefinitely anyway. You know, that that is just part yeah. and parcel of what happened. You know, not every marriage was uh, supposed to be the dream marriage, you you know, there was kind of a, a sense of you just yeah. stay together and work at it kind of thing. Cynthia, Cynthia does talk about this in, in 
her book John. And as I say, I, as I said, on uh, we talked about this before. Cynthia is not, I think, the most reliable witness in terms of timeline, and there is that uh, benefit of hindsight aspect to, to to writing these books. But she does say that her experience was people stayed together, people did not get divorced. You work these things out, and she seems determined to do that. She does not have in mind that John and she will split. At least that's her her take yeah. uh, after the fact. And um, the the next thing that really happens is that John and Paul are heading to New York uh, yep. in mid May as part of the Apple promotion. Cynthia does ask, you know, can she go with John? But he says, you oh, know, no, no, it's 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 a business trip and that wouldn't be appropriate. And instead, she goes to Greece and John encourages her. Now, this seems to be a holiday that is organized by uh, Jenny Boyd, Magic Alex, uh, Gypsy Dave and Donovan. <laughs> You're making these names up, just putting a... Yeah, I'm just making these up. An um, adjective with a Christian name. <laughs> so John John is very keen uh, that, that said, oh, this will be, be good for you. And what, what she says is, back home, the distance opened up between us again. Soon after returning, John was going away. Paddy Boyd's sister Jenny and some friends of ours were planning a holiday in Greece. They asked me along. All of a sudden, John was concerned for my health. It'll do you the world of good, he said enthusiastically. You go. He was so encouraging, I decided to do just that. And she heads off to Greece while John and Paul fly to New York. And they are in New York, John and Paul, from the 11th to the 16th of May, 1968. And as you say, they are there doing Apple business because they've come back from India knowing that the Apple business was the the next big thing that they needed to tick off the list, the next big to-do job. And, yes. uh, you know, fan, people who are familiar with the band will know that in that time they're on The Tonight Show and they do those interviews where, you know, John is in the white suit and Paul is sitting slightly higher than him that are kind yeah. of, because uh, uh, that, that just reminds me of the Ruttles when they're starting and their yeah. business. <laughs> um, and they're not staying in a hotel, is that right? That's right. So uh, they're there. They're, there's a little bit of an entourage with them. So the usual suspects, uh, the usual suspects are there: uh, Mal and Derek and and Derek Taylor and, and Neil Aspinall. But Paul and John, rather than stay in a hotel, they go and stay in the apartment of Nat Weiss, who you remember was a very close friend of Brian Epstein and uh, the lawyer in America. And uh, this is really because one. They don't want to be imprisoned in a hotel um, with fans, etc. So, Nat Weiss effectively gives up his apartment. Uh, he goes and stays in the St. Regis Hotel, and John and Paul stay in his apartment building on East Seventy Third Street in in New York. There's a very interesting description. This is a book, uh, a portrait of Linda McCartney by Danny Fields, who was a very close friend of Linda's, and he says Weiss himself arranged to stay at the St. Regis Hotel planning only to be at his apartment during the day. Before leaving his home in the hands of the Beatles, Weiss replaced his elderly housekeeper because A, he felt it would all be too much for her, and B, John Lennon expressed the wish that whoever was cleaning the place be young and attractive. Hmm. And she why was. Would you, why would you want that uh, person to be young and attractive, Stephen? <laughs> well, she said, she was young and attractive. John was happy and took her frequently to bed. As it happened, mm. the boys were also very tidy. Mm. Said Nat Weiss, Lennon, <laughs> Lennon really surprised me. He was very neat. He would fold all his towels. I've never forgotten that. Paul too. But that was the sort of thing you would expect from Paul. Well, and this was a book so, written about Linda, right? Or, yes. And this is, this is so while, while John is in the bedroom helping uh, the maid clean, Paul is mm -hmm. in the other room folding the towels. It's uh, the it's, odd couple. It, well, it is the odd couple, and it's 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 strange again to think that here are the two biggest stars in the world, and they're they're just um you know living together in an apartment. You know, they're still together, which is kind of curious. It's still John and Paul together, um. But but the other part of that story is that John is still having affairs, according to this book, at this point in time. Exactly. So I I, I think if we take that at face value, um, mm. yes, John is still carrying on the way he has carried on uh, during the early part of the marriage. and mm. uh, Tom-catting, Stephen. That's what I'm going to call it. 
That's that's the word, is it? I'll <clears throat> I'll, I I'll yeah. buy to your uh, experience <laughs> of these things. Um, oh God, no. um so that's their setup they're living in this apartment on the 12th of may um as you do john and paul have a business meeting on a chinese junk sailing around the statue of liberty i mean that's the best place to get things done i think well that's how we started this podcast so (laughs) that's right until COVID stepped in uh we were on a chinese junk on the liffey um and then you know there's also kind of a public relations exercise going on here as well so they're doing like their old school press conferences. Yes. And, you know, they're dealing with various things. They're there to set up Apple, but they're also having to deal with the the sort of the fallout of the Maharishi. And they're being asked, you know, how do you feel about the Maharishi? And they're saying, well, it was a mistake. His teachings are some truth. Um, do you think other people are making a mistake? And they're being quite defensive because this is a very embarrassing public uh, climb down or public yeah. retreat from their, their previous... Um, Support, but basically the idea is is uh, to promote Apple. And some of these some of these press conferences and the appearance on the Tonight Show, they're quite testy. You know, they're they're not yeah. they don't have a, a calm relationship uh, with the press here. It, it's slightly combative the way they're the the way they're they're conducting these. Um, the other person who's there at the press conference is Linda. Yeah, and I mean, in, again, in the movie of the Beatles, you know, it's one of those scenes that you'd hardly believe that, you know, across the audience of the press conference in 1968, Linda Eastman, as she is, is, is sitting there and, uh, and all these things, yeah. all these wheels are starting to move, Stephen. Exactly. And again, that there's an element of mythologizing there. So we focus very much um, on, on the John and Yoko myth, but there is a Paul and Linda myth that she was sort of there at the press conference. But again, this, this uh, book by Danny Fields, he makes the point that uh, Linda knew that John and Paul were staying in Nat Weiss's apartment. She was friendly with Nat Weiss. She asks Nat Weiss, you know, can I can I come and visit? He Nat Weiss runs it past Paul and he says, sure, no, no problem. <laughs> He'd brought a few magrits he wanted to show her. Probably did. Um, <laughs> but at, th- at, at this stage, at this stage, it is, according to Danny Fields, this is still a platonic relationship between Paul and Linda. And um, it doesn't kind of move. It's later in the year that it moves to, to the next level. Is not the phrase the young people use? I, I, I don't know. But, but even still, when, you know, Linda is in a limousine heading to the airport when they're wrapping up in New York. So John and Paul and Linda are in this limousine together, allegedly. It's difficult to, to sift the fact from mm. fiction here and from the mythologizing. But supposedly what happens is uh, Linda, when when John and Paul are heading back to the airport, Linda is in the limousine. She gives Paul her phone number. Uh, and supposedly she writes it on the back of an unused check. <laughs> nice. Um, Hold, uh, there's a lot there's a lot going on there. and uh, But but this John talks about this at some point and said, oh, yeah, that's where I kind of met Linda. Now, he will have met her before because she was at the pepper launch and we you know but yeah, yeah. It met in the sense of actually having any kind of engagement and he rather dismissively says at one point this is much later she was just one of paul's girls mm. you know so again there is that sense that john is 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 looking at this in the same way that you know he's uh uh, hanging out with the saucy maid, and Paul is <laughs> hanging out with Linda, and it is all part of the boys on tour, Tom Catting. Uh, yes, as, uh, as you say, the the interesting thing to me is they are staying in the same apartment, they are sharing that space, and it's just like two friends. But but again, this is the last time John and Paul will kind of holiday together or be together. Yes, you know, in in that kind of manner. And it's just worth mentioning for 60 seconds that, you know, John and Paul's appearance on The Tonight Show is a strange thing. So at the time, The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson was in its, he was in his sixth year. He eventually did 30 years on the air and he was kind of more synonymous, you know, with being from Burbank, California. But the show didn't move there till the early 70s. So it was still coming out of New York City. Um, But Johnny Carson wasn't hosting the show the night John and Paul turned up. It was, uh, I hope I'm saying this right, Joe Garagiola a football yes. player. And it's kind of strange that this is the biggest talk show in America. John and Paul are on. Um, Carson isn't even hosting that night and they don't even keep a recording of it. It's It's been wiped from the archives. We have the, the audio, but not the video. 
Yes, and by all accounts, Paul, uh, John and Paul were not happy that Carson wasn't there. There's also uh, quite a drunk, uh, we can say that, she's no longer with us, Tallulah Bankhead. Oh, um, right, yes. So the, ho- the whole thing is a bit, of a bit of a car crash and the host doesn't really seem to know who John and Paul are, which is odd. Yeah, it's all a bit, I mean, they're there on Apple business and yeah, it's, 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 it's not, the host is kind of stuck in some kind of other Beatle universe, I think, you know, where he's not yeah. really realising what they're up to now. Um, but the, the main thing that we're trying to get across is that change is in the air, you know, they come back from New York and you wonder, well, what's kind of running through John's mind? You know, he's, he's in the state of flux where he's confessing to Cynthia, but he's having moments of peace in India, but he's sending her away on holidays and he sees his friend Paul, who's engaged to Jane Asher, but there's somebody else kind of coming in and, you know, he's maybe he's seeing, well, it's, you know, nothing is cast in stone. No relationship is potentially forever. I don't know. Once again, yeah, the, 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 the urge to do the amateur psychologist takes over sometimes but it's definitely all in the mental soup it it is and i think the two things that are interesting at this time it, it's it's the parallel relationship between john and yoko that's developing and the relationship between john and paul and the, there's uh, the general consensus is that something changes in that relationship between john and paul in 1968, in the middle of 1968. And a lot of people put focus on the experience in Rishikesh, that there is some fracture at that point. But as I say, they're in New York, they're together, they're sharing an apartment together with, you know, rather than staying in hotels and separate rooms, etc. They are acting jointly in in the promotion of Apple. They are taking the lead there. So it seems to me that that side of the relationship is still intact. John seems to be continuing his previous approach to uh, marital fidelity. Mm -hmm. Um, Cynthia makes the point that she and John had a very different background and a very different approach to marriage and expectations. And she does say in the book, John, with hindsight, it should not perhaps have been a surprise to her that John was prepared to walk out on his wife and child given his own experience as a child with his own parents, which is yes. very different from her experience with, with her parents. And uh, she puts a lot of it down to that. So we know that Lennon is a very complex character. You know, his childhood experiences loom large in a lot of ways in his music and his writing, yeah. but also presumably they're impacting the way he's reacting here. Um yep. Plus, also, you, you know, you, you you talk about the solipsism that he moves into later in his Beatles career and in, in, in the early seventies, and you think that's that's it's he's focusing on himself. He's not focusing on his wife. He's not focusing on his child. He's focusing on himself as an artist. And what does yeah. he uh, need to do for himself? Yeah. And I mean, after going through these weeks of change, you know, they come back from New York on the 16th of May and he's had these, you know, nearly two months in India kind of cleansing, meditating, you know, and telling us that meditation is better than any high uh, that you can get. Probably the best thing to do once you get back is just to shovel down some more LSD. Yes, that's (laughs) what you do. Um, Because that's what he does. He he has a night uh, taking LSD um, query on the 17th uh, into the 18th. And assumingly, he's if assumingly is a word, Stephen. Assumingly, yeah. Um, assumingly, assumingly, it's a word. It's a word now. <laughs> Supposedly, um, he, uh, you know, he hasn't taken LSD in a while, and he goes back into, you know, big binge on LSD, which doesn't seem to be um, potentially the actions of somebody who's comfortable with all the stuff that's swirling around him at the minute, and. Uh, I think he takes the LSD and uh, nobody notices. Nobody, nobody notices. Perfectly <laughs> normal. I, th- I think this is. You can see this as a reaction. Uh, we said about in the in the New York press conferences. There's a kind of testy relationship with the press, yeah. and there's clearly still a lot of anger to do with the Maharishi. And it, it, it does seem, you know, possibly is rejecting the 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 rejecting the rejection mm. of LSD by 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 the Maharishi. Um, he is effectively hanging out with Pete Shotton. Uh, yep. at, at, at this point, so Pete Shotton is involved in the sort of retail side of Apple, which is 
you know, going down the pan, really. <laughs> um, he's a teenage friend of Lennon. He is. And, he, you know, so he's he's a confidant and he's someone who's now kind of back in the orbit big time. It, Exactly. I mean, Tony Bramwell basically says, uh, you know, Pete Shotton comes in as Lennon's companion. So he and Pete Shotton uh, spent that night of the 17th, 18th taking LSD. And then John convenes a board meeting at Apple the next day because he's got a big announcement. So he, the Beatles are there. Pete Shotton is there. Derek Taylor, Neil Aspinall he specifically convened this meeting in order to say, I'm Jesus Christ. Mm. He announces he's Jesus Christ. It's not a long meeting. It's quite a short meeting. It's um, quite a short meeting. Yeah, any um, other business? It, <laughs> any, anyone else? Okay. Let's, let's anyone else? That. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Pete Shotton records the fact that they then went to uh, dinner, or sorry, yeah. lunch, presumably, uh, out to lunch. And uh, yes, John Lennon was out to lunch. Out to lunch. <laughs> out to lunch. And uh, at one point, uh, one of the other diners comes over and says, hey, you know, just John and blah, blah, blah. And John announces to him that he's Jesus Christ, at which point the diner sort of goes, I see. Very good. And <laughs> <laughs> move, <laughs> swiftly moving moves, swiftly moving yes. swiftly on. So, so yes, this is, this is the start of, shall we say, slightly erratic behavior. Yes. And, and there, there, are, there are some other reports that there was a return to some drug use once he got back from India, that this wasn't a, a one-off, but he'd had these yeah. weeks of abstinence, as we understand, in India. And then, you know, some the old habits kind of come back in once he gets yeah. back. So he doesn't, he doesn't stay a kind of reformed, um, clear character. So <clears throat> this, is, this board meeting is called, it's the 18th of May. He tells everyone he's Jesus. Pete Shotton uh, gets him home. And John decides, oh, we need to, we need to get somebody else into this uh, party. We need to get somebody in, 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 let's get this party started. What we need is Yoko. So he, uh, this is Pete Shotton's account that they discuss, or John discusses the possibility of getting Yoko or inviting Yoko over. Now, I, I had assumed that this is the first occasion on which Yoko visits the house, but apparently this is not the first occasion. Um, no, which she is has interesting. Been it is. Now, we do know from Paul's account that Yoko supposedly contacted him, first of all, looking for manuscripts for, for a birthday present for John Cage. And he says that he directed her on to, uh, to, to John. And clearly they have met. But in a statement, this is Dorothy Jarlett, uh, who was the housekeeper at Kenwood. And um, this has the nature of a legal uh, <laughs> statement, possibly in the context of divorce. But she says, before Mrs. Lennon went to Greece, I had seen Yoko own at the house twice. I had brought tea and coffee into the room and John and Yoko had always been chatting together. I had no reason to suspect any illicit associations. It appeared to me that she was rather more of a friend of John. She always spoke to John. I never saw her speaking to Mrs. Lennon. On one occasion, I know she stayed at the house overnight, but Mrs. Lennon was there and I made breakfast for the three of them the next morning. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind, yes, that she'd yeah, been there twice, potentially one of those times overnight with Cynthia in the house. Um, so she is a friend, question mark? Um, friend, friend, of, friend of the family. Friend of the family. Um, so, yeah, John has had this day. He needs a break. They decide to bring Yoko over. And speaking of breaks, we'll take one right now. Oh, you're good. <laughs> End of part one. Intermission. End of intermission. Part two. Welcome back. So it's the 18th of May. John is uh, recovering from uh, telling everyone he's Jesus back home in his house in Kenwood. His wife is in Greece. He's with his friend Pete Shotton and they invite Yoko Ono, who's well known to the Kenwood uh, house, uh, to stay. And again, a bit like the, the Hey Jude song itself, there's another kind of creation myth here where, you know, Pete goes off to bed, leaves John and Yoko on their own. And John says, let's go to the recording studio. I have a little recording studio in my house. He, he claims for a guy who'd been, and I think the, 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 the phrase of this episode is tomcatting, for a guy who had been tomcatting, um, he just says, actually, let's go to the recording studio instead. And off they go. Come on upstairs and see my grand digs. 
um, so uh, John in 1970 this says you know when we got back from India uh, myself and Yoko were talking to each other on the phone I called her over uh, Cynthia was away and I thought well now's the time if I'm going to get to know her anymore she came to the house and I didn't know what to do so I went upstairs to my studio and I played her all the tapes that I made all the far out stuff some comedy stuff and some electronic music there were very few people I could play those tapes to she was suitably impressed and then she said well let's make one ourselves and this becomes two virgins this is two virgins and you're kind of struck by that i'm wondering did he ever think of playing any of those tapes for cynthia i don't know maybe it just wasn't that just wasn't the deal it just wasn't the deal but you think he could have played played them to paul well i'm sure he probably did play them to paul you know paul paul is back at his house uh making these kind of tapes yeah. Well, the, the, the legend is that they're playing these tapes to each other and that Paul should make an album called Paul McCartney Goes Too Far, all this kind of stuff. But it still hasn't come that, out. No, but this is where that shift between um, the, the perception or the, the, the presentation of Paul as kind of the arty Beatle, uh, Man About Town type of Beatle kind of tilts over to John because what Yoko does do, and this is totally clear, is, and we see it over the next few years, is kind of give him a license to... To, to just let the art out, basically. Yes, just basically to, to, to do whatever he wants to do. And this is the real shift. And you can see it in, in some earlier songs, uh, but this is the real shift to John placing himself and Yoko absolutely the centre of everything he will do, musically, films, everything. Now, Two Virgins is a spontaneous recording, which John and Yoko make together in the, the Kenwood attic. And that, um, that's, that, that's a very kind description. <laughs> it's, it's spontaneous. Can we read, read the track list? Uh, well, do you know what? When you listen to it on streaming, it just says Two Virgins Side 1, Two Virgins Side 2. And but that's, you can almost that, that, that does it a terrible... That a terrible disservice. Two virgins number one together. Two virgins number two to six. Hushabye, hushabye, and then two virgins seven through ten. And we should say that the official title of the album is Unfinished Music Number One, Two Virgins, and it's the first of three unfinished music experimental albums that they make. But it's certainly probably the most well known. Um, and it also includes, you could argue, some sampling. There's some seventy eight records in there. Yes. Uh, so should we list those? The first is Together <laughs> yes. uh, from 1928 by Paul Whiteman and his orchestra. It features uh, Big Spiderbeck on coronet. Oh, yeah. And uh, then I'd Love to Fall Asleep and Wake Up in My Mammy's Arms. I don't want to hear that. Um, which <laughs> the B-side of Fred Douglas's 1921 single, Margie. So there you go. Well, you know, and it might seem strange to, to include 40-year-old recordings in, in two versions, but that's just the same as somebody these days uh, sampling something from 1982, which was only yesterday, I think, if we check yes. the calendars. Um, so it's... Uh, when did you last listen to Two Virgins, Stephen? I can honestly say I listened to it once all the way through, <laughs> okay. um, and I have never listened to it again. But I do have many version, many copies of this album. <laughs> So just to get this straight, you have more copies than you have times listened to it. I have an original original 1968 stereo copy. I have a mid-70s re-release. I have an eight-track and I have a the secretly Canadian. Uh, I want to recently re-released. I want to say it's on white vinyl, but I'm not sure I even opened it to see if it was on white vinyl. Oh boy! Well, I actually I actually listened to it yesterday because I knew we were going to be talking about Excellent. this today. O and all of it? Did you listen to all oh, yeah. of it, Jason? Oh yes, yeah, oh, yeah, good, I did. Good, 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 uh, good. Well, it's only half an hour long, and what you kind of realise is that, um, and I I don't mean this to sound snide, you realise how good Revolution Nine is because I love Revolution Nine. Yes, which is yes. an amazing piece of it's 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 pop music audio concrete. It's 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 it's, yeah. it's, it's music concrete, but actually with the pop sensibilities of the Beatles, and I think it's an amazing thing. And you, you, there's obviously DNA of this type of tape messing around in something like Revolution 9. But Two Virgins is, uh, I mean, I can understand, obviously it's a great thing to have because it is what they were trying to do, which is a snapshot of that point in time. It's John and Yoko. And, you know, I know it's not the first time that Yoko um, was doing her vocalising or her, her singing, but it certainly is the first time that that very distinctive voice of Yoko's is put in front of a, an audience. 
uh, of, of any significant size. And what you kind of realize is, is that if this is from the first night that they get together, it's very fully formed as John and Yoko. Like 50 years later, you can think, yeah, that's John and Yoko. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, I Part of me thinks it was perhaps a bad idea. Yeah. Because... I think if Yoko's voice had been put before the public in a different context, okay, then the you know she's starting from a prejudiced point of view in terms mm. of the public because there's all that comes with this album. There's the cover uh, that we can spend two or three hours talking about. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's an interesting diary. It's an interesting snapshot, as you say. It it it's almost the bedrock of the myth of John and Yoko that you know yeah. we made we made love as the sun came up and you know there's quite a lot of timing involved in getting that right I would have thought um, <laughs> you know <laughs> so, but but uh, but you, you know what I mean there, there there's even that aspect of the story it's 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 myth making. Um, yeah. And this kind of sits there. And I don't imagine there's a lot of people. It was 5,000 copies were pressed. Mm. You know, there, there doesn't seem to have been an expectation that this was going to be a big seller. Um, and it, it took months and months to, to, to get this, to get it before the public. Uh, well, that's the because, thing. We're still stuck the, in May and it doesn't come out till November, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, like John says in 1980, even before we made this record, I envisaged producing an album of hers and I could see the album cover of her being naked because her work was so pure. I couldn't think of any other way of presenting her. Uh, it wasn't a sensational idea or anything like that. And then he says, you know, my ex-wife was away in Italy. Yoka came to visit me. We took some acid. I was always shy with her. She was shy. So instead of making love, we made tapes. I had a room full of different tapes. We made a tape all night. She was doing her funny voices and I was pushing all different buttons on my tape recorder and getting sound effects. And then as the sun rose, we made love and that was two virgins. That was the first time. And we probably should mention the cover because sometimes I wonder is the only main reason that we remember this album is the cover. I you think know? so. Because I we don't, so. the wedding album and Life with the Lions, the two follow-on experimental albums have very mundane covers and they don't get um, remembered they, in the same way. They don't. They don't. Um, I mean, comments from from George and from Ringo. So George said, uh, I, I don't think I actually heard all of Two Virgins, just bits of it. This is during anthology. I wasn't particularly into that kind of thing. Uh, they got involved with each other and were obviously into each other to such a degree that they thought everything they said or did was a world importance. And so they made it into records and films. Ringo <laughs> says in anthology it's the cover was this. the <laughs> cover I'll not do the voice the cover was the mind blower I remember to this day the moment when they came in and showed me I don't really remember the music I'd have to play it now but he showed me the cover and I pointed to the times and went oh you've even got the times in it as if he didn't have his dick hanging out <laughs> Uh, yeah, yes, it's very funny. It's one of the funnier bits in anthology. And then he says, ah, come on, John, you're doing all this stuff and it may be cool for you, but we all have to answer. It doesn't matter whichever one of us does something, we all have to answer for it. And he said, oh, Ringo, you only have to answer the phone. And I said, okay, fine, because it was true. The press would be calling up. And at that point, I just didn't want to be bothered. But in the end, that's all I had to do. Answer the bloody phone. <laughs> Sorry, I slipped into it there. Yeah. Um, two or three people phoned and I said, see, he's got the times on the cover. Um, the cover drives the album because if it had a cover as dull as electronic sound, you know, would we remember it as much? Or conversely, if electronic sound had had George in the nip, hey, would we remember that? <laughs> would we remember that even better? <laughs> oh, I think that would be on that would be all over Twitter every day uh, if, if, if George had if George had done that. Um, but yeah, John John sort of complains about the fact that this the, there were all these delays and and you know, oh, uh, you know, mine could have been the first. Apple record, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, they didn't take the picture until October. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they didn't really know um, what they were doing with it, I think, initially. I don't, we're not really sure exactly when the decision comes to to put it out. Um, but uh, always, always a good man in a crisis. Derek Taylor is quite happy to plug in and get the job done, you know? He says, let's get on with things. Let's do something about this. It was very interesting and exciting, says Derek. And he, he didn't really have a problem with... I think he liked the challenge of putting out experimental music with naked people on the cover. Yeah. So, uh, yes, I mean, my favorite quote is from Neil Aspinall in uh, Anthology. And so they've taken this photograph in Montague Square, which is Ringo's apartment, which if you remember, this is, this is where Cynthia's mother used to stay. Oh, yeah. I thought Mrs. Paul would be uh, scandalized uh, by this. But 
Neil Aspinall said, John had just given uh, Jeremy Banks, who, who's one of the Apple staffers, a roll of film and said, get that developed, please. And when Jeremy got back and saw the nude pictures, he said, this is mind blowing. He said, everything was always mind blowing to Jeremy. But just that once, <laughs> he was actually right. <laughs> so Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty wild. And, you know, McCartney was a bit shocked as well. But, he, you know, there is actually a quote from Paul McCartney on the back. So even then you still have... John and Yoko, and there's a bit of Paul involved. He's not absent yeah. from the project, which is funny. I don't, I don't understand this quote at all. Uh, you know, being a grammar pedant, I, I just don't <laughs> understand it. it. The quote is, when two great saints meet, it is a humbling experience. The long battles to prove he was a saint. The long battles to prove... To what, prove what is, was, yeah. what, what, you know, well, that seems... The, fir the seems, first sentence yeah. would have been enough. When two saints meet, it is a humbling experience. Paul McCartney. But the second sentence doesn't really make sense. No, no. Uh, unless he's trying to say, you know, the long battles to prove you was a saint, which is that this album will be talking about it 50 plus years later to prove who this guy and who these yeah. two people were. Maybe. It, is, you know. is it the long battle is to prove he was a saint? Oh, and, yeah. And, and, and they've just forgotten to put the apostrophe in, you know. Yeah. The, the long battle is to prove he was a saint. Or the long, or he has to do many long battles to prove he was a saint. I don't know. And if it, if it is the long battle is to prove he was a saint, that's quite that's quite prophetic. Uh, yeah. Um, Derek Taylor pulls another quote from the Bible. Um, so Derek says uh, in anthology, "I found something. I got a Bible. There's always something to hand, isn't there? And there was a bit in the book of Genesis which said the man and his wife were naked and not ashamed, or something like that, which I thought was suitable. John and Yoko were not married, but hey." This was life. And here's this thing in the Bible. So what are the press going to do about it? Uh, and that is um, uh, that is the quote that's also on the back, which is fair enough, I suppose. We miss Derek. Uh, well, yeah, indeed. Um, but as you say, you know, we're talking about the road to Hey Jude. And certainly um, two virgins doesn't get broken out in concert. OK, all the girls, you do your bit. All the boys, you do your bit. Um, so it's, it's quite far away from Hey Jude, but it is on the road to Hey Jude. Um, but this is May 68 and it doesn't come out until uh, November 68 and it comes out on uh, Tetragrammaton Records in the US after Capital refused to handle it. And um, there's a rare mono pressing you want. Is that right, Stephen? Just to go yes. with the other versions you, you need? Yes, there is There is a version. That, uh, the, the, the Apple numbering is SAP Core 2 uh, and the mono version is App Core 2. So if anybody yeah. has a copy of App Core 2 that they'd like to send me, that will be most appreciated for the uh, Nothing Is Real Just, um, yes. museum. And ha yeah. have you have you seen the photograph of John and Yoko and the little old man, <laughs> the little nude man? Yes, I, I saw it some while back. I don't think I need to yeah. see it again. This is a guy who inserts himself into the photo, so to speak. He, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So this, uh, some Yoko mentioned it and uh, said some professor. Uh, you, you know, photoshopped before Photoshop existed and created this third uh, thing. And there's a, there's, I think it's in, in, uh, it's uh, in Tittenhurst. There's a massive poster propped up against the fireplace and it's the two version cover with a third person standing between. And that created a little bit of a stir where you thought, was there somebody else there when they took this photograph? <laughs> but, uh, so I think uh, maybe maybe we we'll, maybe we'll do that for this year's uh, Nothing Is Real Christmas card. And, and that that cover is a selfie. We need to remember that. You know, they were so ahead of their time. Irrespective of what we think about two virgins, um, it was obviously important to them, and yes. uh, it meant an awful lot to them. And um, the next morning, it is May the nineteenth, and that's a busy twenty four hours, thirty six hours. Take LSD, is... call yourself Jesus, go home, make an album with Yoko Ono hook up uh, together as a couple. And then Pete comes in and John just says to Pete, me and Yoko are together. Uh, can you get us a house? Yeah, just like that. <laughs> I mean, you, you can understand why this seems like witchcraft. Yeah. Yeah, well, th that is the kind of one of the many pejorative kind of notions that gets put about about Yoko in 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 the yeah. aftermath of all of this. But you know, we've we essentially in the course of an overnight, we go from a position of this married pop star who has had many infidelities throughout his life, which none of which have seemed to have any particular huge significance. Maybe some of them have been, you know, more than just one night affairs, but. Uh, this 
event happens and all of a sudden like in the space of a few hours pete's just gone to bed and he's woken up to his best friend yeah. saying this this is this is the person now and it is a it is a wild story yes and pete Chotton says at this is speaking in 1983. He says, I also understood immediately that John really would not hesitate to sacrifice everything for Yoko, least of all Cynthia, whose name was never even mentioned that memorable morning. Unbelievable as that may seem in the light of the fact that John and Yoko had barely known one another 12 hours earlier. Now, that's maybe overstating the case in yeah. terms of their, their relationship. Yeah. But non nonetheless... John is literally saying, uh, uh, with the, you know, 12 hours after she comes to the house, go out and find me another house to live in with Yoko. And over the course of the next few, Pete Chotton will do this. He will go and look at houses um, uh, and, and try and find somewhere uh, for them. The even stranger thing is that he was right. Like, it, it was... Yeah. And I hate to kind of frame it this way, but it was the right decision. Now, I know John, a few years later, is unfaithful to Yoko and goes off on the last weekend and, and all of those kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, um, it's it's still John and Yoko. And he makes that decision and it, it's a lock. Like, it, it, there's, there's, again, we talk about parallel universes or other, other, you know, other ways things could have gone. It's not like by... You know, July, John and Yoko have split up and no. it's just a, a strange thing that maybe got him out of his marriage or whatever. But he's right. This is it. And whether there's some kind of switch that was flicked where he, he, he had been consciously or subconsciously looking for the alternate existence. And then as soon as he found it, he just put his money down and said, this is it, which seems to be what's happened. Yeah, it's, it does seem to be instantaneous and permanent. Yeah. And... The first thing that happens is Pete Shotton takes Yoko into town, into London, to, to clothes shop, to buy her some clothes. <laughs> and again, what we have to remember here is Yoko is sort of quintessentially the struggling, penniless artist at this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you know, I, I, so the first thing John says, well, we're going to have to go and buy you some clothes. And and they, they do that. And... Um, Tony Bramwell uh, says uh, the next day, John sent Pete up to town with Yoko to go shopping and Yoko moved in to Kenwood. By the time Cynthia arrived home that fateful morning from the airport, having made up her mind to forgive John for the sake of their son, Yoko had been installed in the house for four days. So yeah. she just moves in and doesn't leave. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's you know, May the 19th is the morning that Pete shot and uh, walks in and finds John and Yoko together. But yeah, it's the 22nd of May when Cynthia arrives home. Just as a side point about Pete Shotton, you know he went off and founded the Fatty Arbuckle chain of restaurants in the post Beatle no. universe. I don't know if you remember those restaurants. I remember them uh, from like visiting England as a, as a kid. They were these kind of chain of restaurants across the UK that would serve steak and burgers and things. And doesn't, made sound, doesn't sound very appealing. Uh, well, no, but it was reasonably successful and he cashed out for a couple of million in the 80s and... Um, did all right for himself in the end, Pete Shot. And just, just because we do seem to be saying, oh, every Apple store he was given crashed and burnt to the ground. <laughs> he was actually a good businessman at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, the 22nd of May, uh, Cynthia arrives home from Greece. And again, you talk about Cynthia being occasionally unreliable as, um, as, as the author of her own story. But th there's this question of, she rang John to say, I'm on my way home and because uh, cause the plane that she's getting home stops in, in, in Rome or she comes in unannounced. What is the truth? Do we know? Yeah. Well, what we, what seems to be the, the, the consistent uh, story is they have breakfast in Greece. They fly home. They stop in Rome and they have lunch. Mm -hmm. And Cynthia says that she phones John from Rome. Because what she wants, that she thinks it would be great fun. Uh, th this is uh, uh, Cynthia, Jenny Boyd, Donovan and Gypsy Dave are all flying home. And uh, they think it would be the great crack to have <laughs> breakfast in Greece, lunch in Rome and dinner in London. So on one account, she phones, she can't get a response. But yeah. in, in the book, John, she says then... There was a reply. She phones. She speaks to him. He, she says, I'm coming home. And he's fine. Great. 
uh, at perfectly normal. And so he has advance notice of the fact in, in one telling that Cynthia is arriving home and she arrives, Julie arrives at Kenwood around four o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. And it's John and Yoko are just sitting there as if nothing is uh, strange is going on. Yes. Uh, possibly Yoko is wearing Cynthia's robe or yeah. again, in different tellings, she's not. So in one... Uh, in one telling, uh, Cynthia finds them wearing tarling robes and she thinks, oh, they've been for a swim. Uh, in another uh, occasion uh, telling, she's uh, Yoko is wearing Cynthia's robe, which is, I suppose, like a sort of dressing gown or something uh, like that. But she, she arrives in, they're sitting there and she says, I wanted to say, wouldn't it be lovely to have breakfast in Greece, lunch in Rome and dinner in London with you? Uh I thought that would have been lovely. And then she says, I just trailed off and burst into tears because it's very obvious to her what what has happened. Mm. There's an amazing quote from Cynthia in 1980 where she says, they looked so natural together, I felt a stranger in my own home. I think that's, yeah. that's extraordinary because, again, I don't know if it's looking back through history, playing tricks on us that, oh, we just see John and Yoko together in our mind's eye. But mm. like, she's one of the first people in the universe after yep. Pete Shotton to actually see them together to make an external assessment of the situation. And she says they just look natural together. And she, you know, out of all the things that poor Cynthia has been through, you know, the confessions and the, you, you know, emotional estrangement, so to speak, um, to actually see that and to kind of probably figure out in the moment that this is a different type of thing and that there is a, it kind of, in a horrible way, almost makes sense to her. Yeah. Um, I, have, I have a lot of sympathy for Cynthia Lennon. Oh, and we, we, we talked about it in the bonus episode. I think she gets very unfairly and very quickly written out of the script at yeah. this point. Uh, the, my difficulty is that Cynthia is a very unreliable narrator of the story. And the, the, the story has changed slightly over time, her assessment, you, you know, so that that statement that I look so natural, I felt like a stranger in my home, that, that's from 1980. Um, mm. By that stage, she'd already had a book out, um, A Twist of Lenin. And I do yeah. remember John trying to, I think it was serialized in the news of the world. And I do remember John trying to get an injunction to to stop the book being published because there was a big headline. I have cut it out of the newspaper and I still have it somewhere, which is Lennon squashed. Because that's what you do with judgments. <laughs> you squash judgments. Um, there you go. Classic. Classic tabloid pun. There were only a few people present. You know, Jenny Boyd was there. Uh, yeah. When this happened, they, they were sort of in the hallway when this when this happened. She does corroborate uh, Cynthia's account that this was a shock, that this was, uh, you know, a very, very difficult uh, encounter. Yoko tells it somewhat differently. Yeah, well, what, what does Yoko say exactly? Well, she uh, recounts this, and this is a direct quote. She said, that's a dramatic story. I'm not saying it came from Cynthia. I don't know who, maybe some writer embellished it or something like that. First of all, the driver, that was Lennon's chauffeur, and Lil, that would be uh, Cynth uh, Cynthia's mother, Lillian Powell, they were reporting to Cynthia all the time. She knew it was an open thing in a way. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, that's exactly the same terminology that Paul uses in many years from now about his relationship with Jane at the same time. Yeah. And uh, Yoko says, the first time that Cynthia came, she was with Paddy Boyd's sister and Alex, and there was another person. So Cynthia and Alex and Paddy Boyd's sister and whoever the guy was said they were going to visit and mm -hmm. they came in from the garden side. I immediately tried to sit a little further away from John and John said, no, don't worry about it. It's okay. He grabbed my hand and we were sitting together kind of thing. He wanted it that way. I don't know why. He wasn't like, my wife is coming. I have to hide this situation. Totally not like that at all. They stayed a while to say hi and left from the front door. Not in a huff. There was an underlying tension, but we were all civil like the flower children we were. I was wearing a kind of Indian shirt, one of those loose cotton pullovers in the Indian big pants. And their visit, their visit yeah. happened in May. 
immediately after John and I started living together. So yeah, that, she, she, she couches it in terms of Cynthia came to visit her own home after I had moved in four days previously. You know, it, it, it's it's. This is a bit like that movie Rashomon, you know, where you see it from all the different perspectives. And yeah. every time the story gets retold, you know, you're like, oh, well, you know, I'm Yoko and I didn't see Cynthia rush out and cry yeah. and collapse in a state yeah. somewhere else. Um, but Cynthia does go off and she stays with uh, Jenny Boyd and Magic Alex, who were roommates, but not a couple, platonic roommates. And uh, Julian stayed with um, Lil, Cynthia's mum. And... Uh, there's this presumption, but uh, Cynthia denies that Cynthia and Alex uh, hooked up, but that's yes. not really true. Cynthia denies that. Cynthia said, you know, that she she got very drunk. He got very drunk. He made a pass. Uh, she rejected him, and he kind of crawled off to sleep in the bath, presumably. And uh, that situation persisted for a few days, where she's living there with 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 Jenny Boyd and Alex is kind of staying out of the way. But it's, it is important to remember in the context of what will come later is that, yes, Cynthia and Alex are in a flat together. Alex has made a pass. Nothing's happened. But Alex is John's friend. And all of this will come back into play uh, in, in the weeks and months that follow. Now, as if that wasn't a busy enough day, you know, you'd already be exhausted after all of that happened. But the exact same day, and incredibly, the 22nd of May, John and Yoko step out together for the launch of Apple Tailoring, um, which is an event where George and Patty are the only other immediate Beatle crew uh, there. But it is audacious in retrospect that they're three days a couple. They've hours before they've interacted with Cynthia and they walk together as a couple in public, knowing yes. that there's press photographers there. And we have the photographs of that day. And in an odd way, the penny doesn't really drop at that time with the press photographers that this is what's happening. That still follows the following month more so. Yes, it doesn't seem to be. It's just that Yoko is part of the one of the crazy hangers on in Beatle world. And yeah. the, the press do not seem at this point to be making the connection. Now, again, the timeline here, you know, Cynthia says they arrived home at four o'clock in the afternoon on the 22nd, yeah. but um, that, that must like literally, literally must have been as soon as, as soon as Cynthia goes, get your robe <laughs> off, get changed. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we've got a function to attend. Uh, it, the whole timeline around here is very odd. Yes. And this is what Apple tailoring that they're attending a function for. This isn't the Apple boutique. This is a different. No, thing. this is, this is a different thing. Uh, th th this is a, this is a, great little kind of diversion that we can talk about. Um, so Apple yeah. Tailoring, this, this, this is uh, uh, at 161 Kings Road, Apple Tailoring Civil and Theatrical. So it's, you know, mm. you can go and get your bespoke suit or your uh, pantomime dame costume run up. And um, it's uh, run by an Australian designer called John Crittle. And it's uh, Dandy Fashions was uh, his firm, which had opened in 1966. Neil Aspinall is a director, mm -hmm. and that was all part of Dandy Fashions transforming into Apple tailoring. Um, it would last a little bit longer than the boutique, but it does close later in 1968. John Crittle is an mm -hmm. interesting character. Yeah, because he's involved in this. He is. So he, he arrives in London in 1963. His first job was at a boutique called Hung On You, which is at 22 Cale Street in Chelsea, just off the King's Road. Sub fun fact about 22 Cale Street, Chelsea. It later became Jane Asher's cake shop. All connected. It's all connected. And there's another fun fact about John Crittle, Crittle that he is the father of uh, ballerina Darcy Bussell. She doesn't like to talk about it. No, they're estranged, but, um, you know, it's very interesting. And uh, in the basement, a hairdressing salon. Run by Leslie Cavendish, the Beatles hairstylist. We are going to have to get Leslie We're Cavendish to, get Leslie to come yes. on. Uh, I don't know if you've read his book. It's very entertaining. <laughs> um, so that's the 22nd of May. There's photos of John and Yoko stepping out together, but it gets even crazier. Two days later, we believe, is the day that the Isher demos take place. So yes. that that is 
an extra, that's a busy week by anyone's standards. <laughs> it is It is a busy week, but they, they, they had a day off on the 23rd of May because I realized what happened on the 23rd of May. All my loving, the Tony Palmer documentary was shown on TV. So, oh, so they, presumably they, were, they, they were watching that. And then we're, we're not entirely sure of the date of the Isha demos, but generally accepted it's, it's the 24th of May. And the question is, was Yoko there? Yes. At, well, uh, yeah. W- w- we've solved the was Yoko at the Ballad of John and Yoko uh, mystery yes. on this very podcast. Was she yep. there? Uh, Richie Unterberger, who's a fantastic author who's written The Unreleased Beatles and, and many yep. other things as well. Um, he believes that she was there because you can kind of hear some voices on some of the recordings. Yes. Uh, he said uh, certainly one of the distant background voices on some of the more fully harmonized demos like Revolution could be Yoko's or for that matter, another non Beatle who was part of the inner circle like maybe Patty Boyd. Um, and he said both Rhodey and personal assistant Mal Evans and Derek Taylor is addressed at various points and it's possibly that they, they were also uh, recorded in, in the background. But I think that's another key question that if Paul, if Paul, when Paul comes on to nothing is real. <laughs> That's going to be one of the key questions that we ask. Uh, you know, hello, Paul. Welcome to Nothing is Real. Can you tell us, was Yoko <laughs> present at the Isha demos? It's a perfect icebreaker. Uh, but the, the the creation myth that John and Yoko, that, you know, they record two virgins, they get together, Cynthia comes home, it's a little bit underdone by the fact that on two days later, on the 26th of May, um, Cynthia comes back to Kenwood. Yoko's not there. And John is sort of acting as if nothing has happened. Yes. And you're going to make me read out the next line in these notes. Go on then. That night of her arrival home, John and Cynthia made love. But (laughs) (laughs) Um, welcome to Nothing is Real After Dark. Um, Yeah. And so there's this kind of very small window where... I think the phrase might be in modern parlance, gaslighting, where he's kind of saying, yeah, yeah Cynthia, everything's fine. And he's, he, this kind of a, Cynthia recounts that there's kind of a little bit of hope, a little bit of affection coming from John. Um, but yeah. that, that, that can't be really. It's, it's very strange. Well, by all accounts, yeah, she does move back in and yeah. uh, all, all is restored. And he affects surprise and and bemusement as you know like oh where have you been and uh, what was what was what was wrong so what, what Cynthia this is in 1994 bearing in mind my my caveats uh, uh, mm-hmm. you know about about her understood reliability oddly enough the weeks passed and on the surface it probably looked as if we were happy john was unusually demonstrative he kept coming up to me and putting his arms around me and saying i love you he'd never been a demonstrative man but suddenly he was always hugging me and whispering things that were very special i should have been pleased but inside i felt strange the words and actions were lovely that gave me a little hope but i couldn't shake off the feeling that was all a bit unreal john was covering something up Mm. I mean, you do wonder with Cynthia if there's a bit of ghostwriting going on with some of these uh, books. I do, know? and as as a as a lawyer, I should say uh, this would have uh, removed her ability to effectively sue for adultery. I think back in 1968, the fact that they had got together and done that thing they did when they got back together. <laughs> Objection overruled. Okay, um, the 30th of May, uh, the Beatles finally get back into a recording studio. They It is the first day of recording for the White Album. They begin with Revolution 1, which we've covered in three other episodes. Um, but Yoko is in attendance. And she will essentially, this is the start of Yoko being beside John for the next five years. Yes. I. This suddenly occurred to me, and I'm sure there must be an exception to this, but this suddenly occurred to me that... The other Beatles were never in John's presence without Yoko being there. None of the other Beatles were in his presence without Yoko being there, un- possibly until John is in L.A. Uh, mm. in, in April 1973, and they're recording I'm the Greatest, mm. which, is, which is crazy. It is, it is quite something. Yes, it's quite, it, it's quite an odd thing to think. But it's, it, it's, it's even odder that, you know, John and Cynthia are still a married couple in Kenwood for another short period of time. John and Yoko are the inseparable couple in the studio. So obviously John is separating from Yoko occasionally yep. to go back to, to Kenwood. Um, 
But then Cynthia goes off on another holiday. There's an awful <laughs> lot of holidays happening. I don't mean to sound, tr- you know, rude or, um, you know, glib about any of this. But th- th- this is about holiday number four. They've been to Greece yeah. and they've been to India. Morocco. And they were in Morocco. Morocco at the start of the year. Yeah. So this is holiday number, this is the fourth holiday. And... um. Cynthia flies off to Italy on a uh, family holiday. And this seems to be that Cynthia's, again, Cynthia said, you know, my mum knew nothing of the Yoko affair and our recent troubles. And she'd been pressing me for some time to take Julian on a family holiday. So the notion of this holiday is that Julian gets to go. Um, So she and my Aunt Daisy and Uncle Bill had discovered a wonderful hotel, which was perfect for kiddies. Um, In that case, I said to John, do you mind if I take Julian and mum to Italy? Go ahead, he shrugged. The day after the day we left, John didn't even come down to say goodbye. We said our farewells, and John stayed in bed, not bothering to get up to wave us off. So this is uh, at the start of June '68, and this is this is where the actual separation happens while Cynthia's away. Yes, and I mean this is Cynthia writing in 1994, and she does say, "I had a dreadful hollow feeling inside as I led Julian to the car. Nothing had been said, but we couldn't pretend any longer. Our marriage." was over. But that clearly is written with hindsight because, uh, you know, it's reckless in the extreme, I would suggest, Your Honor, for (laughs) Cynthia Lennon to head off on holiday knowing that only a few weeks before she's done exactly the same thing and John moved Yoko into the house. so did she really think the marriage was over? She's she's been they've been reconciled and and living together f- for a week or so it, and and again she talks about them living together for a couple of weeks. The, the, I say the timeline is all over the place here in Cynthia's very various, various accounts. But absolutely it does seem to me this is you know this is the this is the split point. And why would you go off on holiday if if you felt your marriage was under that kind of threat? Um, and and it's the the event that kind of drives this home is that while Cynthia is in Italy on the fifteenth of June, nineteen sixty eight, John makes his actual first formal public appearance with Yoko, um, and their classic John and Yoko planting acorns for peace at Saint Michael's Cathedral in Coventry. Yeah, and we've talked about this in the context of uh, Ballad of John and Yoko. You know, fifty acorns tied in a sack. He's this is this is well, this becomes the acorn sending acorns to world leaders. But this is, this is the first appearance of acorns in the John and Yoko myth. But even this event of just classic John and Yoko planting acorns, it's going to be another three days before the press get a version of the story that is able to be promoted as John leaves wife for Japanese artist. But we're going to cover that in the next part of, believe it or not, this episode was about Hey Jude. <laughs> yeah, it really was. Um, but this is all important because without any of these events happening, Hey Jude doesn't exist. The whole point of Hey Jude is wound up in all these very crazy weeks of John and Cynthia and Yoko's existence. And that's just the truth of it. Yeah, that's it. Back to your uh, statement, you know, the... the- <laughs> <laughs> we we intended we intended this to be about Hey Jude. We did intend this to be about Hey Jude, but it is all about Hey Jude because this is the road to Hey Jude. Because what happens next is the formal public split of John and Cynthia Lennon, and as we all know, that is what creates the song Hey Jude. But we are going to cover that next week in the next part of our uh, coverage of Hey Jude. Um, but what do you think, everybody? I'm sure you all have your own thoughts but on this issue. We are available in all the usual places, www.donaldthingisrealpod.com, which is the website, the portal to all the things that we do, at Beatles Pod, uh, the Twitter account, um, the Nothing Is Real Facebook group with 6,000 members there. We can chat about all things fab, the Instagram run by William. Thanks, William. And we also want to thank all our ACAST Plus subscribers. There's a whole other world of Nothing Is Real. If you haven't uh, become an ACAST Plus, it's all too much supporter. There's uh, another hidden series of Nothing Is Real there covering such exciting topics as the Beatles houses and the incredible story of the American Beatles, which is a good one as well. Loads of stuff there to enjoy. And we're putting out extra episodes all uh, along with this season as well. And there is an episode on uh, John and Cynthia Lennon to go along with these Hey Jude episodes at this point in time. But for now, my name is Jason Carty. My name is Stephen Cockcroft. And this has been Nothing Is Real. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.